Hello, I'm happy to be here. My name is Eric Gruner. I'm the Associate Director of Innovation at the Center for Translational Research in Neuroimaging and Data Science. Um, I met uh, Emma at, I believe it was OHBM. We were both kind of in a similar sphere of differential privacy and de decentralized machine learning. So uh, it was fortunate that we met and uh, her and Andrew invited me to this conference, which I hope I can give you guys a nice show today. Um, so today my, my topic is just an introduction to CoinStack uh, with a, a, a video demo. A CoinStack is a decentralized, differentially private application for neuroimaging. Now let me introduce the Trend Center. So it's, the, um, it's a center for translational research in neuroimaging and data science. It's a tri-institutional effort from Georgia State University, Georgia Institute of Technology, and Emory University. And we're located in Atlanta, Georgia. Our focus is on neuroimaging, specifically um, machine learning and signal processing on neuroimaging data with the goal of translating the, our, our work into biomarkers that can help either treat or learn about um, brain health and mental health disorders. Now, we also do lots of multimodal data fusion and large scale data sharing like CoinStack. Now for, I thought I'd introduce the type of data that we, that I, we deal with since I know probably most people are not brain people. Now the first, we, we deal with MRI, which is uh, magnetic resonance imaging. People get in a big scanner. Uh, it's a, like a three T Tesla, three Tesla coil, and then bounces radio waves off of, um, off of someone's brain and off the water molecules in your brain. And, and then, which allows you to image the brain. Now the first modality that we, we usually use is structural MRI. And structural MRI is a high, high detail um, image of the brain at a, a static image. Um, this is useful for uh, mental, this is useful for um, identifying uh, issues in like what parts of the brain may be involved in different mental disorders. For example, schizophrenics have different, have smaller parts of their, parts of their brain are smaller. And um, like I think uh, all, is it, um, autism, autism spectrum disorder, they have other um, structural ab abnormalities that you can detect compared to a control patient. And so here you can see a nice structural MRI image. You can see the we're interested in the gray matter, which is the, the neurons, the cell bodies, the white matter, which is the, the strands, like the, the connections between the neurons. And then other things like the CSF, which is the cerebral spinal fluid. Mostly it's the gray matter and the white matter. Uh, next, we have functional MRI. Now our center is probably specializes in this and is known for this more so than the other two modalities I'm going to cover today. The first, so with functional MRI, instead of a static image, what you do is you take a, um, you have somebody sit in a scanner for maybe a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so, and you give them a task, say um, identify, and maybe they'll show you like a color words in different colors and then you have to say what the color is uh, what the color of the word is not what the word says so it just uh, challenges your ability to um, you know it, it just it's kind of a challenge for you so it tells how well your your brain um, your brain networks work for this sort of task now you um, so what you can see what what it does is it's um, you can, it allows you to see what areas of the brain are active during, during a task. So for instance, if it's a vision task, then the area in the back of your brain, I believe it's the occipital lobe, is, will be active because that's where your visual cortex is. Now you have, um, and so you'll, you'll be able to see that in an MRI image because the returns from the MRI will be stronger in the, in the back of your brain. And if it's a, if it's like a reasoning task, then maybe it'll be in your frontal cortex. 
then what you can do is you can see these uh, time courses and you can you can do regressions against um, you know when you did the task and then how and you can see how what what areas of the brain light up and you can do some other interesting things like uh, group independent component analysis, uh, dynamic functional network connectivity, and so on, which I'll go into later. And diffusion MRI is the last uh, MRI modality we also we use. Diffusion MRI, it's, um, it tracks the, the molecules in your brain, as movement of molecules in your brain. Um, now this is, so what this does is it gives you tractography the uh, the paths in your brain between different or the paths between different areas in your brain and this is useful for um it's just another way of looking at the brain and it's useful for um you know identifying differences between people with mental problems and people who are controls now you can imagine this data is it's quite, um, it's kind of, it's not your typical data. Like a lot of times in machine learning, you have you know, millions of samples or a billion samples or something, you know, or you have a huge corpus of text. But in neuroimaging, you have very few samples. Each sample, each subject um, scan session may cost, you know, 600 or $700 US to, to acquire in addition to the time. And not only that, but you can see that your that your brain is like a fingerprint. Um, even if you even if you do things like take away the skull, you know, take away the skull, take away the face, the each person's brain is going to be slightly different. So even if data is anonymized, you you can still there's still a chance that you could re-identify the the anonymous data, re-identify re the person's brain by with if you had another image of it. And because these these studies often have medical information, like uh, you know maybe how what scores does this person get on depression on a depression test or a schizophrenic test, or uh, their age, their weight, just all kinds of information that that people want to keep private. And because of that, it's kind of hard to sh it's not always easy to share this kind of data. There is a lot of anonymized data out there, but a lot of but sometimes it's just not possible to share this data which is a shame because data sharing really helps. It increases the visibility of your work. It improves public transparency and reuse of your data, which is very important for neuroimaging because the data is so expensive. Also, it allows you to be, build better machine learning models and better regression models, both for prediction and for inference. Then obstacles to data sharing are maybe intellectual property, confidentiality issues, fear of somebody um, you know, using your data to publish before you and people not understanding your data and so having putting out a false or a uh, misleading interpretation. Or you, the most important is just you want to protect subject privacy. And many times also you may lack the permission of your institution or maybe your government. Uh, every, every country has their own um, regulations around medical information. In order to, in order to, to deal with this, we created the coin, we created CoinStack, which is the collaborative informatics and neuroimaging suite toolkit for anonymous computation. Now CoinStack enables analyses without sharing. So each person's data stays on their own system and only the derivatives are shared such as the model weights or the um, just, you know, some other derivative, maybe a probability distribution. And then allows you to collaborate with researchers around the world in doing both neuroimaging pre-processing and advanced st statistics and machine learning. We also have differentially private computations. And differential privacy is something that we've thought about even from the, you know, the beginning of CoinStack. The application is built in JavaScript using Electron. It's a standalone application you can download for either Windows, Mac, or Linux, and it's got a user-friendly interface written in React using Material Design. 
the, um, the, the analyses run are open and reproducible. The software is completely open source and free. And you can, because the analyses are encapsulated inside of programming languages, they are, sorry, inside of Docker containers, any programming language can be used to, uh, for your mathematical computation. Then because these, uh, these Docker containers, the software inside of them is stored on GitHub, you're able to see exactly what was done inside the containers. And you can also download the Docker containers and, and, and shell into them and see what's going on inside of them. So this makes CoinStack both open and reproducible. Now let me talk about the timeline of CoinStack. Um, so a little bit before this, I, I'm sure most of you know about Cynthia Dwork and her paper in 2006 on differential privacy. Um, I believe uh, Sergey Plis and Bamzi Poltaru, they were at a conference where she presented and they thought, well, you know, it'd be really cool if we created something like this for neuroimaging. They could do machine learning. So about two years later, they submitted an NIH proposal, which was funded the next year or sorry, yeah, or funded uh, about a year and a half later, finally. And in the interim, they published a paper uh, with Anand Sarwate about uh, differential private, differentially private support vector machines, which I'll show you today. Then NIH funding began in 2015, and we, a little bit before that, we got our first CoinStack demo created and then released publicly in 2016. And since then, we've been doing lots of neural imaging, or we've been doing lots of decentralized um, machine learning research, um, focusing on neural imaging applications. Now, the computations we have available include regression on free surfer volumes or in voxel-based morphometry maps. Um, basically, a free surfer volume, free surfer is just a program that neural imaging, the neural imagers use to uh, segment the brain into different its different parts, and then you're able to and it computes the volume of each part of the brain. And this is useful for uh, regression, like for regression models. So you're trying to model maybe certain covariates like age, gender, um, healthy or control versus patient, and then do that and against maybe the the size of somebody's amygdala, or their uh, frontal parietal cortex or something like that. Then uh, voxel-based morphometry is just breaking up the, taking the brain and finding the probability of each voxel, each of the several hundred thousand, thousand voxels being gray matter or white matter or CSF, or and I think there's a few other tissue types. So it's a good way to see how much, you know, what how much gray matter is in someone's brain. And it's very useful as a, a pre-processing computation for neuroimaging. We also do decentralized group ICA, the dynamic functional network connectivity, um, Mankova, decentralized DSNY, TSNY, and differentially private support vector machines and logistic regression. In progress, we have decentralized mixed effects regression, decentralized neural networks, canonical correlation analysis, and so on. We're also looking into genetics pipelines and um, doing brain age computations. Now let me talk about the first computation, which is regression on VBM maps. Essentially what you're doing here is, you're, is it's like what I just described. You have, your, you have multiple covariates, and in this case age, I think it's the total, total intracranial volume, site, gender, and smoking and you're creating hundreds of thousands of little regression equations and you're seeing how each of these each of these covariates affects the the um, amount of gray matter in each voxel or the probability of gray matter in each voxel so you can see it gives you like a nice map and you can get both a beta coefficient and a p-value and these are nice for uh, writing papers and seeing the effects um, you know, how these covariates affect the brain or the relationship between the brain and different things like smoking. Then dynamic functional connectivity is another, is another one that we 
uh, th this is like what our lab specializes in really is functional network connectivity. Um, we do, it's a process of principal component analysis, independent component analysis, then, step, then doing a bunch of correlation matrices, cross correlation matrices between all the different components and then at different, different time intervals and then doing a clustering algorithm. So grouping all these different uh, connect correlation matrices together into states like brain states. And I'll show you more what I mean. Um, independent commodity analysis, it's like um, essentially you're trying to find independent signals among when there's a lot going on. Uh, you can imagine it's like the classically you can think of it as a cocktail party problem. So imagine you're at a party and it's very loud and lots of people talking and you have you have a recording and you want to you want to just isolate the voice of maybe two or three people. Now it's a they use like the so the, they use independent component analysis to do this and it's a similar it's analogous to what's going on in the brain. You have lots of different areas um, act, being activated and working together, but you want to isolate each area in the brain. Now you have the, so for instance, in this, um, in this slide, you have the, the frontal lobe in blue, you have the occipital lobe in yellow, and you have some other, um, you have some other components. There's like green, some red, and so each one of these has its own time course, which has been isolated using independent component analysis. And then these are these are for the group. Uh, th these are valid for across the whole group. So there's um, not just for a single subject. Now you have now imagine you have these time courses, and what you can do with them is you can correlate them with each other, and that gives you an indication of how the which which areas of the brain are working together. Now, if you're doing a task like reading, then maybe the language area of your brain and the visual areas are, are both active at the same time or at, around the same time. Now that gives you these big correlation matrices. So imagine on the X axis and the Y axis, there's a, each one of these, each one of these rows or columns is a is an area of the brain, is one of those signals. And then this is a cross correlation matrix. Now the cross correlation matrix, and then you can see that um, in this case, there's five, this has already been, um, so um, imagine you have this cross correlation matrix taken as a, with a sliding window uh, over the course of a few minutes during the task. Now, then you, you have lots of these matrices and then you group them to get, you use a clustering algorithm to group them together. Then each one is, then you, you cluster them together and maybe usually like four or five states. And I don't want to say they're mental states, but they're, they're states, they're physical states in your brain. Now you can see that some of them, like the middle one, there's very high correlation within certain networks. And then there's low correlation outside of those networks. So that's um, so that's that means yeah, the, and that's generally how the brain works. It's um, it's generally modular in how it operates. Uh, inside some networks, there's there's tend to be tends to be more communication within a, a single domain than between than between domains. Now you can see here that and then what you can do is you can compare that for healthy controls and for, um, for patients. Now, um, just, looking at the, just looking at this connectivity matrix, it doesn't really, it's very hard to see differences. But then if you look at the, the figure on the right side, it shows the difference between the controls and the, the patients. And you can see there are st some statistically significant differences in certain parts of the brain. And then you can, and then this is useful to tell. Well, you know what's what's wrong. Uh, it, it helps inform you. What with, it helps to um, both inform and confirm uh, knowledge that has been found by medicine about the brain and about the disorder.
And here's a screenshot of dynamic functional connectivity on, in the CoinStack application. Um, of course, this is in CoinStack, we do it in a decentralized fashion. So there's, um, there's like five different steps that are all done in a decentralized way. Um, next, we have DSNE, or sorry, decentralized TSNE. Um, I, I think this is a pretty common algorithm, but um, if you don't know what this is, this is a, a way of visualizing data. Um, it's, very, it's become very popular over the last 10 years or so. Uh, and it, it can take a very large, uh, very high dimensional data and project it onto a 2D plane in a way that preserves the actual relationships in the, in the data. For this, this these, are, these are handwritten digits, the MNIST data set. But then you can also use it for, um, for also brain images, like structural brain images. And you can see how, how they're similar and how, they, how they're grouped together. Uh, finally, um, something we've been paying a lot of attention to is decentralized neural networks. Um, now, this, these are very important for medical imaging because neural, or sorry, medic, the medical field, because a lot of it is imaging. Now we have, um, in, this, in this slide, you can see that we have, we compare the centralized case with a decentralized case. And you can see that they're almost the same. There's about a 5% um, accuracy hit. But this is not too bad, considering that none of the data is shared. Then you have, any, which, and if you compare that to the individual sites, they're both below 50%. So you're seeing a, a, very, a very big gain in performance by using a decentralized algorithm. And this is, I think it's especially important in deep learning because these neural networks have so many parameters that you need lots of subjects, you need lots of training data which decentralized, decentralized computations can provide. After that, we have, then let me, let me just uh, walk you through regression, which is our, one of the simplest applications that we have. Now, this is a typical setup. We have a central node on the left, and then on the right, we have three, three sites. These could be um, research centers or just individuals and each site has their own data. Now, the, the top site in black is the, is the creator or the, compu the consortium owner. And all, you can say all these sites are in what we call a consortium, or more simply, just a group. Now, the consortium owner and everybody involved, they decide, well, we're going to get together and we want to analyze um, volume in someone's brain versus age and whether they're a control. So the consortium owner create, decides, um, chooses those covariates and that, in, in that dependent variable. Then they send that model structure into the remote server, the central server, which then sends that model to the other sites. After that, each site maps its data to um, maps its own data to those variables in the equation. Uh, a lot of times this may be a spreadsheet or text files. Then the next step is fitting. Um, the computation kicks off and each site um, computes that model on their own data. Then they send the fitted model back to the remote site. Notice no data leaves the site, only the model, so only a few numbers. Then the central site aggregates all of the models and computes a global model, which they send back to the other sites. And each site can see how that model behaves or how well it fits on their data. Finally, um, so a lot of, uh, we have a lot of regression equations and those are, it's, it, uh, they're very useful for science, actually, because regression is just very, just a very common, um, probably the most common model that scientists use. Now, uh, let's talk about differentially private support vector machines. 
Uh, I don't think I need to explain what differentially, differential privacy is to everybody because this is open mind. So we, um, so I'll just get to it. Um, now we have a, the point of, so let's think about what you have to do to train a distributive classifier. The point of it is you want to, you want to use information from lots of different sites to classify your data, but you don't want to, you don't, you need to protect privacy so you can't just share the data. Now this final training may be on a private data set or a public data set. So what they do is they, um, they map the, well, what happens is they, each site does, computes a, um, computes weights, like a, a model, a machine learning model, which you can see is W. And then they, they share those weights with the, with the final site, which does a, which uses, which does its own, a second level of training using each of those models, um, computed, um, used on their data as, um, as features. So you have, so the, the features here are the X tildes, which are just the model applied to the, the data on this final site, D0. And so the X tildes, those are the inputs for the final, for the final model, the second model that's trained. So you can see that this, um, this allows you to, allows people to train, train uh, SVMs on their own sites and then share the share the information they've gained with another site, which then can use it, which then uses that data to to build a better model than what they had before and what they could do by themselves. And you can see here, uh, here's from the paper we published in 2014. Um, this was a this was on let's see, a reverse Boltzmann machine was used to on um, I believe it was uh, BBM, pre-processed data, uh, so structural MRI. And then it was, the RPM was able, was compressed the information to, into 50 features. And then those 50 features were used as inputs to the SVM classifier. Now you can see here that each, indiv each individual site performs a lot worse than the combined aggregator. Now the, each site gets maybe 20 to 25 percent error rate, but the combined classifier, which is still not not centralized, but just uses information that's been that's gone through this uh, this differentially private SVM, still achieves an accuracy of around five percent, which is very nice because considering that not only do you not share the data, but you're also offering differential pri differentially private guarantees to the, the data owners. So there's noise being added. There's like Laplacian noise being added. And the, the, the performance is still very good. Then let me take a break from this PowerPoint to show you a demo of the application. Okay, now here we're in the CoinStack application. I think it's better. Okay, sorry, when I was recording this, it got cut off a little bit. I didn't have time to re-record it, but um, I think it shouldn't interfere with anything. Um, so here, here's uh, when you wanna create a consortium, just type in the name and the description of the consortium, save it, and then you can add more people. After that, you can add a pipeline, which is the model you're going to run for this consortium. Now here I'm just typing in the name and the description. And then I'm adding a, the computation, which is DPSVM. Now there's a bunch of parameters here for, well here first you add the, the measurements, the covariates. So these are brain volumes, selecting the third, fourth, and fifth ventricles. And then I'm also adding other covariates that 
that are used in the computation. So whether the person is a control or a patient and how old they are. And then there are lots of hyperparameters you can choose, like what's the binary label, what it's the regularization parameters for both the, the second level um, machine learning model and the local machine learning models. You can also set the, pause that. So then you can also set the epsilon, which is the privacy parameter. And you can also set the Huber constant, which is just um, has to do with the loss function inside of SVM. Now you're able to, it's, it just makes the, the loss linear after a certain point, after 0 0.5. Then you can also set the train test split at each site. So you can see this is more of an application um, rather than a library like PySift. This is more of a, an application directed at end users. Okay, after that, download the data. So you're downloading the Docker container and then mapping the data. So you're getting a CSV file with the covariates, like I showed you in the in the screen in the uh, presentation, and then you can map them to the variables in the equation. And you can see all the hyperparameters there. All right, now we're ready and you can kick off the pipeline. You can see a little notification when the pipeline starts. This one only takes a short amount of time. Um, some of these take a pretty long time, but this one only takes about a minute. Um, you can see the, the state on the local site and on the remote site. And you can see who's the bottleneck, who's who you're waiting on. And this is only two steps and it's, the data is not very big, so it only takes a short time. And you can see the results. You can see the gives you truth tables, or sorry, confusion matrices for each site. Um, on here, they're, uh, it's not accurate for this, but you can just see how, the, how it works. Um, I think we just need to tune the hyperparameters a little bit better. So, but you can see that you can see the utility of this. All right, then. All right, now we've we're in several research collaborations. Uh, where one is with GIGA, the Global Imaging Genetics of Adolescents. They do, um, they're examining the relationship between behavior and neuroimaging and genetic data. They have, it's a global consortium. It's with sites in Europe, Europe, the UK, the US, China, and India. And we published one study with them and we're going to do another study with them in a couple weeks. Another, another one of our collaborators is Enigma. Um, Enigma is uh, enhancing neuroimaging genetics through meta-analysis. And they have 50 working groups. Each working group focuses on a different brain disorder, such as schizophrenia or bipolar or depression. Now, they were, they were kind of um, trying to accomplish the same thing as CoinStack, but before there was a CoinStack. So they were, you know, as I said, neuroimaging data is very expensive and um, somewhat precious. It's um, hard to come by. So you have to, and so to find effect sizes, to find to see the effects, you need lots of data. So what they were doing is they were emailing um, software to like scripts to different different people, having them run the scripts on their own data, and then emailing the results back. Now what we do is so CoinStack is an upgrade from that because it allows you can do everything within the application, and you don't have to, and it, it takes much less time and is pr less prone to error. So if all this excites you, then uh, yeah, please work with us. We have, um, you can help create a computation. If you wanna try to create a computation using um, Open Mind Library, that'd be great. You can also, if you're, a, if you're a researcher, you can run a study with CoinStack. CoinStack is a, um, it's focused on neuroimaging, but these computations can kind of work on any CSV data. So anything you can put in a table, you can, you can run a regression on. And then 
also you can contribute to the code base. It's an open source project and we'd love to have more contributors. And if you wanna learn more, you can connect to us, visit us on our website or go to our GitHub page. And specifically, you can email me. Um, thank you very much for listening. And then now we can go to questions. Let's see. I will, I'll stop my, oh, let's see. Stop my screen share for now. Okay, so um, yeah, Fed, do you want to see? Is there any? Do you want to? Um, do you want to read the questions to me? All right. So I wanted to ask you a question about the SPM uh, deep pri private. She said, "Say is that so cool? Did you see the talk today from the validation team? And she said that they have a validation team that is dedicated to validating the library for privacy leakage. Okay. And if you got any validation team, might be worth collab might be worth a collaboration." Yeah, that's cool. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely, yeah, I'll definitely look at that. Um, yeah, we can connect after, maybe next week about that. That's pretty cool. I don't think we've gotten to the point where we. Um, where we're like keeping track of, um, you know, privacy leakages at that at that level, but that's definitely where we want to go. So they also said, uh, like, she asked about adding other people. She said, is those uh, other data owners or other uh, or adding other subjects? Oh, um, I guess you're probably talking about the diagram where there was, yeah, um, you know, like the different blocks and you have like each site. So um, those are generally different researcher with lots of subjects. She said, it was, she said it was on the demo. Oh, on the demo. Oh, yeah. okay, yes, right. Um, those are, yeah, th so like the test one, test two, test three, those are different researchers. Ah, also so she asked, sorry. Yeah, so those are, so each one is like, um, so e each one of the participants in the, um, in the consortium is a different researcher or a site. And then within each site, there's lots of subjects. It could be maybe 50 subjects or it could be thousands of subjects. Um, okay, is there, are there any other questions? Okay, looks like nothing else right now. Um, yeah, it, it takes a while to, to bring somebody up to speed to actually program in CoinStack. Uh, the last time we did this was, I mean, it took, it was like two days and it took, <laughs> took hours to go through the onboarding process. So I didn't want to, um, I, I knew that wasn't going to work today. So I just wanted to give an overview and just, you know, kind of introduce the application to everybody. Um, yeah, thanks. And I, yeah, and Enigma is pretty cool. Um, and they're, what, the, what they're doing is pretty awesome. So yeah, if you guys, um, I mean, yeah, if there's a way for us to work together, that would be great. Um, so I will, uh, okay, with that, I, I guess that's it. If there's no other questions, um, thanks very much for giving me this, this opportunity to present here. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. I'm glad to have you at Open Mind Conference. Hopefully yeah. we'll see you in the next conference. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you all, all right. everyone for attending. Yep. All right. See you guys later.